God is sovereign, okay? Now, I'm kind of weak, and I'm, you know, I don't have my voice back yet, so I need you to help me, okay? So God is sovereign, amen? amen. Good. Now, what I mean by God is sovereign is I mean that he's supreme, that he's the ruler of the universe, he's absolute, he's unlimited, he's unrestricted, he's unrestrained, he's unbound, and all things are under his control. When I say that God is sovereign, I mean that he is God. Nothing tops him, nothing can topple him. He is God before you even recognize that he is God. He is God. Let me give you scripture for that. Just one to begin with. Good job. Nice. <coughs> Increase their pay, guys. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him... All things, I want you to track the all things. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things together in one voice now. All things, one more time, all things. When I talk about the sovereignty of God, I'm talking about all things under the control of the eternal, almighty God. Nothing goes beyond his care, beyond his sight. He knows, he sees, he does. Everything is under the hand and the care of God. All things are under his care. And all things were created through him and for him. God is sovereign. <laughs> now, in God's sovereignty, the next three minutes, I'm going to unpack 13 hours of theology, okay? So it's going to be worth your tithe and your offering. All right, <laughs> here we go. God's sovereignty, all things under his care. Now in his sovereignty, think of it like an umbrella, okay? In his care, in his sovereignty, he has ordained for you, each and every one of you, to come to a place of belief. You cannot say God is sovereign, so okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. I'll just go do my own thing. And God is sovereign, so he's already ordained the end from the beginning, so whatever must happen, must happen. No, 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 no. In his sovereignty, he has ordained for you and me to make a choice, to believe, and to come under his sovereign rule and reign. Okay? Theologians struggle a lot with this. A lot of doctrines are written about this on free will and the sovereignty of God. God's sovereignty is not a tug of war with man's free will. In God's sovereignty, he has ordained for you to have to come to him and to believe. Let me give you some scripture for that. Um, and you will understand why I'm going into this. In John chapter 6, which is where we are, in verse 29, <coughs> it says, Jesus answered them and said, This is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. This is the work of the sovereign God. The sovereign God wants to save you. You cannot save yourself. That's the work that only God can do. No man in his flesh can save himself. So God wants to save you, and this is a sovereign work of God that you believe. So under the umbrella of God's sovereignty is your little umbrella of belief and faith, of coming under his care. Back in John chapter 6, over and over and over again, Jesus talks about this. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, that is your, you know, your decision. That is your responsibility. Whoever comes to me shall not go hungry, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. This, in John chapter 6, Jesus goes over and over and over again. He feeds 5,000 people with, you know, a, a, a boy's lunch. Does this beautiful miracle. This is the problem, though, folks. <coughs> the people... They recognize that Jesus is someone special and someone great. And they want to make him king, but they have a sovereignty crisis. They don't want him to be the sovereign ruler over them. They want him as a king. They want him as a leader. They want him as, as a political leader. They're like, hey, we'll put your bumper sticker on the back of our camels, but don't talk to me about you being God. So they all leave. The thousands of them go away. And Jesus is going to turn to his disciples, we're going to see, and he's going to ask his disciples, his 12, are you going to go too? Sadly, this crisis, this unbelief of God's sovereignty doesn't leave with the crowd. Track with me. It doesn't leave with the crowd. There's one guy among the 12 who stays. He doesn't go. He stays. But he doesn't look at Jesus as a sovereign ruler, God, over his life. 
Want to take a wild guess who that guy is? Everybody knows, right? It's Judas. The question that I want to pose to us as a church is, have you gone through those dark nights where you wondered if in the sovereign plan of God, you're trying to be a Christian, you're trying to be a disciple, and you wonder if in the end, are you just going to be a Judas? You see, that's why I want to call it the sovereign crisis. God is sovereign. He knows the end from the beginning. And I'm trying really hard to be the disciple that God's calling me to be. And I'm with him. I'm hanging out with him. I'm doing ministry with him. But in the end, am I going to be a Judas? And is there any way that I can know if I'm actually more of a Judas than more of a Peter? Because Peter did a lot of stupid stuff. And we're struggling with the sovereignty of God and our responsibility of believing. And how many times we as Christians, maybe this message is just for me, we try so hard to grow in our belief, and yet we toss and turn in our bed wondering if we are in right relationship with Jesus. Now, there are many promises of God that says, anyone, my sheep hear my voice and nothing can snatch them out of my hand. That's a beautiful promise. But how many times you wonder if, am I in his hand? Or am I just another Judas that's hanging out with Jesus, says I'm a Christian, I spend time in my Bible, I spend time in the Word, but I have a sovereignty crisis. Am I really under the sovereign care of Jesus? I want to hold these two disciples, Peter and Judas, and take two of their qualities and hold it in opposing views. And I want to build this message from that. I'm going to use John chapter 6, a few verses, just as a springboard to jump into this message that I waited for many years to preach this man, and I believe that this message is going to stop many, many of you from killing yourselves, literally. Because I know the darkness that we can struggle with in this nightmare of wondering if God loves you. Like this lady this morning says, can I really come back to Jesus? Is it really possible for me to come back after I've denied him, after I've walked away from him, after I have demeaned him? I want to talk about affiliation with an affection position and not possession and service without surrender. I want to, we're going to look at these two disciples and I want you to be able to gauge yourself if you are more of a Judas or if you're more an authentic disciple of Jesus. And it's quite possible that you're more like a Judas this morning, but praise God that that's time for you to repent. Affiliation with no affection, position but not his possession, service without surrender. Are you excited for this morning? You should be, man. I'm excited to preach this message, and I'm going to preach it like it's my last. So let's look at this, number one, affiliation without affection. To have an affiliation is to have an attachment or to be in collaboration with someone, to be in partnership or in a relationship with someone. Now, Jesus had just fed, the Bible says 5,000 people. That might have been more because they weren't counting, um, you know, the women and children. (coughs) Excuse me. And Jesus tells them, you have to eat. My, my body, my, 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 this is my body broken for you that, you know, we went through that last week. My, my, my body is the bread that comes down from heaven. They said the saying is too hard. They got offended. They walk away. And they break affiliation with Jesus and they walk away. And Jesus turns to his disciples in John chapter 6, verse 67. And Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? In other words, do you want to break affiliation with me too? Do you want to break this partnership that we have too? You've been a disciple, you've hung out with me, you left everything to follow me, and now these thousands of people are going, they're going away. In fact, the way this is, this is worded in the Greek, it's a negative. Jesus is pretty much saying, hey, you should be going also. In other words, saying, how come you guys haven't left yet? How come you've not broken affiliation with me? But look at verse 68. Simon Peter, he always speaks up for the whole group. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What's he talking about? He's talking about the sovereignty of God. You have, that is, you possess all things. You remember we spoke about the Colossians? You have the words of eternal life. What you're drawing from is nothing that our Pharisees and our scribes can draw from. You're pulling stuff from things that no man can talk about. You have the words of eternal life. Where can we go? You are the sovereign God. And then he says, and we have believed My responsibility, I have believed, I've come. And he's speaking for all the disciples. So he says, we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see those umbrellas over there, God's sovereignty and the disciples' responsibility. 
We have believed and have come to know that you're the Holy One of God. But Peter is not sovereign. And there's things that Jesus knows about his disciples that Peter does not know. And so Jesus unleashes and he says, Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12? And yet, one of you is the devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. And this is where my dilemma begins. Because when I was studying this, I thought I want to talk about, you have the words of eternal life. And Peter, finding out about how did Jesus know, how did Peter know Jesus' true identity? And flesh and bones have not revealed this to you, Peter, but it's my father that's drawing you. But God said, no, this is why the dilemma begins for many of us as believers. Am I like Peter or am I like Judas? Because Judas was one among the 12. And Jesus says, did I not choose you? And yet one of you is the devil. And if you've ever wondered, like me, if you are a Judas in your relationship and you're trying to find out and you have this crisis in your hand, you need to ask yourself, are you more concerned about your affiliation or your affection with Jesus? The crowd left. Jesus, uh, Judas hangs, hangs around. But we see that in the end, he betrays Jesus. He cared more about his affiliation than any affection that he had for Jesus. Compare this with Peter. <clears throat> John chapter 13, we see Jesus. They're in the upper room having the Passover meal. And it says Jesus got up, took off his outer robes, tied a towel around his waist, pick up the, picked up a bowl. And he's getting ready to do the task of a slave, of a servant. This was tradition that whenever they sat down to eat, someone would have, the servant would have to come wash their feet, but there's no servant over here. So they're all sitting over there with dirty feet. Dudes, we don't care about dirty feet, right? We're like, we can do our manicure later. Let's get to the meat. Right? Where's the grilled lamb? <coughs> but Jesus gets up, and he's like, man, I got to wash your feet. And he begins to wash. But look at what Peter says, okay? Look at affection. I want you to, to look at the affection that Peter has for Jesus. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus washing everybody's feet, and Peter's like, Jesus, no. You should never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have what? No part with me. Unless I watch you, you have no part with me. Now, when we read this passage, typically, at least for me, okay, I'm guilty of this. I am so distracted with Peter, right? Because Peter's being crazy over here. He's like, no, by no means, Lord, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus is like, dude, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And then Peter's response, then Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And then Jesus answers, and he says, those who had a bath need only to wash their feet the whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that's why he said, not everyone was clean. Picture this with me, please. Jesus is going one by one to all his disciples, washing the feet of his disciples. He comes to Peter, and he says, unless I wash you, Peter, you have no part with me. And Peter, he's like, I don't want anything to get in the way of you and me being in intimate relationship. Give me a bath. Let's go. And Jesus says, hey, listen, listen. You don't need a bath. You're already clean, Peter. But not all of you are clean. You and I know who he's talking about, correct? Jesus knows who he's talking about, correct? Peter does not know. But there's one other person in that room that knows who Jesus is talking about. Judas knew. Judas knew that he did not have any part with Jesus. Judas knew he had no affection towards Jesus. Judas knew he had no relationship with Jesus, but all he had was the affiliation. And can you picture Yeshua now on his knees, washing Judas's feet? And Judas doesn't break out in tears in repentance at this point and say, forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me. I've been a disciple of yours all this while, but I genuinely have not had any love for you. I've not had any respect for you. I've not respected you as a sovereign God, as the anointed holy Messiah that's sent from heaven. I've been plotting against you. Forgive me. No. He had no affection. In fact, right after this, Judas gets up and he goes, and the Bible says it was night. 
what do you do when you find yourself in failure? We all fail. We all fall. What do you do when you find yourself in failure and you wonder if you've been predestined for doom? Are you Judas? You've got to ask yourself, am I investing more in my affiliation with Jesus or in my affection towards him? You see, far too many times we are more concerned about how people look at your Christianity than how Jesus looks at you. Church, let me say that again. We are so concerned about how people look at your Christianity. Oh, do those people respect me as a Christian? Do those people respect me as a pastor? Do those people respect me as a, as a person who knows the Bible? Do those people respect me with how I speak and what I say and how I dress and how I look? And Do they value me as a Christian? Do, will they come to me for input? God doesn't care about that if you don't have an affection towards him to begin with. And oftentimes, we're so concerned about our affiliation with Jesus that shows the world than we are about our affection with Jesus. And you're going to see how crucial this is when we end the sermon and how this is so vital. And that's why I love that the mission of our church is that we will have intimacy with Christ. I don't care what we look like to the world, man. I want to make sure that every time we come together that you are growing more and more intimate with Jesus because what's going to matter when you stand before him is not your affiliation. What's going to matter is did you love my son? Did you have affection towards him? So many people are wanting to have the affiliation with the church, affiliation as a disciple, affiliation as a pastor, as a worship leader, as a ministry founder, but have no affection for Jesus. Number two, we see that he had the position, but no possession. Prominence is something that everybody wants at some point, at some level in their life. We all have a need and a want to be appreciated, don't we? If you work hard, you want to be appreciated. You want to be recognized for that. And you can imagine being a disciple of Jesus. That would have been a very coveted possession for many people, a position for many people. And Judas made it in. Man, when Jesus was walking with his 12, they'd be like, man, there's the 12 disciples. Right, when Jesus sent out the 72, he anointed them and sent them. Judas was one among them too. But we see that throughout the Gospels, Judas did not have the same heart that Jesus had. He seemed to care more about what he could get than the joy of actually belonging to Jesus. Don't forget again, I'm just using John chapter 6 as a springboard to, to unpack this, this message that I believe God really wants to speak to you. Judas is a character that shows us, it, it stands as a warning, folks, that this is what will happen if you're careless with your spiritual life. You turn into a colossal failure. You squander the calling of God in your life. And you waste the opportunities that God's given you. Judas had an opportunity to walk with Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus. And instead of making Jesus his greatest possession, he started using his position to gain more possession. And we see this in the book of John, chapter 12, where Jesus, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And so... The sisters, Mary and Martha, say, Jesus, you got to come home for dinner, man. We've got some, you know, fried chicken. And I know the Passover is coming, so you're going to eat a lot of lamb, but we got some good dinner. The Bible doesn't say fried chicken, but that's what I would imagine because that's what I'd like to eat, you know, some spicy fried chicken. It's six days before the Passover, so Jesus therefore came to Bethany. This is John chapter 12, verse 1, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. You can imagine the love in that room, can't you? Lazarus was dead, man. They're weeping and mourning for the loss of a loved one. And they're crying and Jesus shows up and he's like, Lazarus, come forth, dead man walking. And they're like, dude, the least we could do is throw a dinner for you. Come on. You can imagine the love in that room. They're sitting over there, they're eating a meal. And there, Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. In this context, if I were to put that into one word, it's affection. Do you see it? Mm. She took a pound of pure perfume. Uh, we're going to see it's worth about 300 denarii. It's about a year's wages, like nearly $40,000, okay? Like one pop pours the perfume out, man. I, I like good perfume, but I wouldn't spend 40 grand on a perfume. And even if I did, I'm not going to use it all in one shot, you know? It's like, here we go. But you can imagine the affection that she has for Jesus. Tell me this, 
Is she looking for affiliation with Jesus? No, she cares more about the affection. Is she looking to be in a position of ranking with Jesus? No. Does she care about her possession? No, she's pouring it all out. You see, worship is not just singing songs with a guitar and hitting notes and harmonies. This is worship. She's pouring out her affection. She's taking all her possessions, her most prized possession. She's sitting there watching Yeshua eat a meal that they cooked with love, and she's like, what more can I do? I know the thing that I've been hiding for years and years and years, I'm going to pour that out. And she pours it out. Glug, 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 glug. That's the noise of the perfume coming out of the bottle, okay? And then she undoes her hair. The book of Corinthians tells us that a woman's hair is a glory, and she's bowing down at the weight of his glory and wipes his feet with her hair. What kind of worship is that, huh? But look at the interruption. But Judas, one of his disciples, who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Ah, do you hear the noise? Do you hear that? Worship, love, affection, adoration. Jesus, you are my prized possession. I will give everything. You are the pearl of great price. It's you that I want to be with. It's you that I'm affectionate towards. And Judas comes like, um, check, check, check. Um, excuse me, guys. I don't want to quench the spirit over here, but, you know, I mean, it would have been fine if he said, hey, can we open the windows? Because it's getting a little smelly in here. And that would have been fine. But he comes and he says, hey, excuse me, you don't want to crunch the spirit, but couldn't we sold that for 300 bucks? I mean, we didn't have to put it in the marketplace for too long. With that low prices, people would definitely buy it. And we could have given it to the poor. He didn't really care about the poor, John says. Look at this. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. In our words of what the context I'm preaching, he cared about possession. So he used his position as a disciple to gain possession. Oh man, can I get a little under the skin of some people now this morning? How many times we use Christianity to gain possession? I mean, this is the first prosperity gospel preacher right here, man. How many times people get into ministry just because they want an easy job? How many pastors are behind the pulpit right now because they won't last one day in the real job? How many times people go to Bible college and ministry because they're too scared to go into a real place where they have to encounter real things? Believers, I'm telling you, you cannot use your Christian position just to gain possessions. The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And oftentimes as believers, we, change, we chase after possession. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be poor and, and look like Job with the sores and, and torn clothes. I have torn clothes, by the way, so I could say that. No, God will give you what you need. But this guy is using his affiliation with Christ, his position with Christ, to increase his possession. I'm glad that Jesus doesn't stay quiet. Because when you stop authentic worship, listen to me, when you interrupt what God is doing, when you begin to get in the way of God, when you get in between the hammer and the work of God, you get crushed. Jesus rebukes him. The language in English is very mild, but Jesus says, leave her alone. Back off, Judas. Get away from her. The rebuke is so harsh that he's going to leave with his tail behind his legs, and he's going to go straight to his cowardly high priest and sell Jesus for merely... 30 pieces of silver because he didn't have any affection for Jesus. All he cared about was affiliation. All he cared about was using his position to gain more possession. Back off. Lee, I thank God because you know what? When I stand up here and doing ministry, man, there are many Judases that get in my way. And I thank God that Jesus stands up and he fights for the people, people who are really standing up and preaching the gospel. He stands up for those who are really trying to live your life well. Like the woman caught in adultery. Do you remember that? We're going to get to that very soon. I'm so excited to preach that. She's stripped almost naked, man. She's brought before Jesus. And they're like, we need to kill her. We need to stone her. They're trying to use her as a bait to get Jesus killed. And Jesus, I don't know what he's writing in the dirt. And then he says, where are those who accuse you? She says, they've all gone. He says, well, I don't accuse you either. Go sin no more. Crazy. I love how Jesus stands up for those who've been abused. I love how Jesus stands up for those, like those Samaritan women by the well. 
He goes out of his way to go meet with her. It's so scandalous that the disciples are like weirded out that she's like, man, I'm going to leave my parts. I'll come back later for it. And she runs away. Leave her alone, Judas. Back off so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. She has affection, Judas. You know nothing about it. For the poor, you always will have with you. Your good works you can always do. Your charity works you can always do. Your charity does not outweigh affection for Jesus. But you do not always have me. Look at this in contrast with Peter, folks. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus, Yeshua, was walking by the Sea of Galilee. You can picture him, right? Sovereign, almighty God, cruising by the Sea of Galilee with his Jerusalem sandals on. You know, getting sand in his feet. It almost smelled the, the very fishy waters over there. And he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. <laughs> Can you imagine that? He sees them, man. They're working over there. I wonder if there was a smile, if there was a stare. I don't know what it was. But he said to them, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. What did they do? Immediately, they left their nets, and they followed him. They didn't care about their possession. Now, you could say, well, that was a first call. Okay, let's look at it towards the end of the ministry years of Jesus' ministry years. Matthew chapter 19, verse 27. Then Peter said in reply, see, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? We left everything and followed you. <laughs> we left father, mother, mother-in-law, which was easy to leave. But fishing nets, fishing boats, sorry. The Bible does talk about Peter's mother-in-law who was sick. And he left, we left everything to follow you, Jesus. And this is not going to be up on the screen. Peter would write later in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Believers, you know what I'm talking about when that day, when the Holy Spirit woke you up. And you said, God, I'm yours. Maybe you were driving. Maybe it was in a church service when you came up front. You're like, I'm yours, God. All of me for all of you. I am your possession, and you are everything to me now. I want you and the joy of your salvation. You remember that day? See, if you're a believer, you know what I'm talking about. When Jesus became your prized position, a possession. For Judas, he never really had that. All he cared about was how he could use his position as a disciple to get more stuff. You see, Peter left everything. James and John left everything. This is not about how much have you given to God. Listen to me. This is not about how much you've given to God, but this is about how much do you belong to him. How much do you belong to him? Christian life is not about making this one decision. One day, that's a good thing. Salvation happens in a point in time, but then it's proven over time. So at a point in time, you gave your life to Jesus, but then has it been proven over time as you continuously live a life of surrender, live a life of treasuring Christ, making him your prized possession, or have other things gotten on the altar of your life? There's a very false idea in Christianity that says that the more you serve, now I know nobody preaches this, but it's an understanding, the more you serve, the more you're right with God. Because we hear things like, you know, saying, there's no Christian that, you know, doesn't serve. Every Christian's got to be serving at some capacity. We've got to be disciple makers, which is true. But somehow, in our Western mind, we have this idea that if I'm serving God, I'm safe. Your service does not aid to your salvation. You don't work your way to your salvation. If you're serving, praise God. I thank God for it. And you know what? You're storing up blessings for you in heaven. You're storing up treasures where moth cannot eat, and thieves cannot steal. Praise God for that. But your service does not aid in your salvation. And oftentimes people think that because I'm a pastor, I'm fine. Because I'm a worship leader, I'm fine. And Judas, he had the position, man. But you got to make sure that Jesus is your prized possession. So the question for you then is, what are you chasing after in your Christian life? Because if you're chasing after just a, a position so that you can be fine in leadership or to be a pastor. I know many times um, in the church, and even when I was a young person in ministry, uh, I was chasing after position. I was like, man, if only I was, if, if I would just be a pastor, I'll be fine. If I would just be a worship leader, I'll be fine. I'll go join this ministry, go that ministry. And I'm telling you, 
you cannot run away from those dark nights when doubt begins to creep in and you ask yourself, am I a Judas or a Peter? If you're chasing after disposition and Christ is not your prized possession, you're going to end really in a dark, dark, dark place. Let's move on very quickly because my strength is running out. You can't tell, can you? I do a good job of that. Lastly, we see that Judas gets service without surrender. Do you know that Christian life is the most joyful life you can ever live? Do you know that? Like, I'm not talking about a churchy life. I'm not talking about become a church person, get a church membership, and you'll be the happiest person. But come to Jesus, and I'm telling you, you'll have joy that you've never known. You'll have peace that you've never known. And it's true. Because I've lived life on the dark side for a little bit. And looking back now, knowing what I know about who Jesus is, I never want to go back. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't fail. I do fail, but I want to come back to this relationship that I have with Jesus. Because the joy that comes from Jesus is very different from the joy that the world gives. The world does have joy, but it's fleeting. It fades. It dies. And you always pay for it. The joy that you have with Jesus is something that the world cannot give and the world cannot take away. And Christian life is supposed to be such a joyful thing. But when you are living your Christian life as a service with no surrender, it becomes very bitter. It becomes very rotten. It becomes very smelly. Because you, on the outside, you have all the right fittings as a Christian, but inside you have no surrender. You know how terrible it is when you really want to go live like the world, but you got to put on this Christian shell and act like a Christian? It's terrible. It's horrible. And sadly, in many churches, we have people that are like this. They have service, but no surrender. And sadly, they're just Judases who have the affiliation, have a position, but no surrender. Right after Jesus rebukes Judas, he runs off, like I said, to the chief priest in Jerusalem, and he makes a plan to betray Jesus. It says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 14, then one of the 12, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. Wow. This guy, he was serving Jesus. Jesus was his leader, his master. And he had a job. He was the keeper, the accountant. Here the accountant takes his money bag and he goes and he sells his master out. Here he's fighting for 300 denarii and there he goes and he sells his master for 30 pieces of silver, man. Crazy. He has a service. No surrender. And what happens later that night is crazy because he sells Jesus out. He comes back to the Passover meal. Jesus is washing the feet, which I spoke about earlier. Jesus once again gives him this beautiful warning. Not everybody is clean. A chance to repent, right? But he doesn't. And this night, what happens is very crucial. Pay attention. We're going to bring this to a close very soon. What happens this night is so, so, so crucial. There are two disciples, Peter and Judas. Peter is not without fault. Peter does something really stupid too. Do you remember? Cock-a-doodle-doo. Peter... Standing over there, he denies Jesus three times. But look at this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 75. But Peter remembered the saying of Jesus. Listen to me very carefully. Peter remembered the saying of Jesus. Peter remembered the saying of Jesus. He denied Jesus three times, saying, I don't know this man. He cast him out, man. But he remembers the words of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Oftentimes we focus a lot on the, wept, on the weeping, but I want you to focus on he remembered the words of Jesus. You know what that means? He had affection to fall back on. He had the words of Jesus to fall back on. He had a relationship with Jesus that he was able to fall back on. He remembered the words of Jesus. Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. When you come back, strengthen your brothers. He remembered the words of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, in the dark nights of your soul, when the enemy comes in and speaks lies to you, saying that you're doomed for destruction, 
Do you have an affectionate relationship with your Savior that you can fall back on and remember his words? Or is your Christianity all about affiliation and you have nothing to fall back on? Because if it is just affiliation, look at what happens. Matthew chapter 27, verse 3, we have Peter, we have Judas. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, listen to this, he changed his mind. I looked this up in Greek. He changed his mind. It could mean he repented. It could mean, in fact, NIV, I think, says he, he was remorseful. NASB says he repented. He changed his mind. He turned around. And he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. So he's remorseful. He's repentant. He's sorry. He goes back to the chief priests and the elders. And he says, I have sinned. By betraying innocent blood, he admits that he was wrong. He tries to turn things around. He says, listen, I betrayed. He admits that Jesus is innocent. Everything seems right. But they said, what is it to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and he hung himself. I want to talk to those of you who are on the verge of killing yourself. And I want to say, stop right now. Please don't kill yourself. Because... All that Judas had was affiliation. Listen to me. Peter had an affectionate relationship. He remembered the words of Jesus. Who does Judas go to? He goes to the people who were the enemies of Jesus. He goes to the chief priests. Not knowing that he had sinned against God, not the chief priests. But he couldn't go to God because he had no relationship with him. What does David say? Against you and you alone have I sinned. Although he had killed Uriah. And raped his wife. But he says, God, against you and you alone have I sinned. And repentance comes and forgiveness comes. Because all sin is towards God. No wonder the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. He didn't just have affiliation. He had affection. He didn't just have service. He had surrender. When the dark nights come, ladies and gentlemen, the enemy will have a field day in your mind and in your spirit if you don't have a genuine relationship with Jesus. If all you're chasing after is just possession, but he is not your prized possession, the enemy will win. And if all you're caring about is your service, your good works, your titles, but no surrender, you'll be running to the enemies trying to seek restitution. But Peter is over here weeping, remembering the words of Jesus. This is why I think many of us who say that we're Christians, the promises of God don't encourage you because you don't have a relationship with him. That's why when the Bible says that my sheep hear my voice and nothing can snatch them out of my hand, it doesn't feel like it applies to you because all you have is an affiliation, not an affectionate relationship. Judas stands as a lesson. It shows us our evil potential. It shows what spiritual carelessness can do. It shows what wasted opportunity looks like. It shows what sinful lust of possessions and power can take us. And there's a time that will come when repentance is too late. It was too late for Judas. There's a parable that Jesus shares. It's one of my favorite parables. It talks about two sons. The youngest son goes to his dad and he says, pretty much, dad, I wish you were dead. I want all my share of my inheritance now. I don't want to wait till you're dead. You're as good as dead to me. I want your inheritance now. Don't forget, God is sovereign. The father is sovereign, but he gives into his son. He gives him the stuff. He says, okay, here you go. You have a choice. And he goes. And the Bible says that he squanders all his father's money very quickly gets rid of it on frivolous living. He blows it all and he finds himself in a foreign land, in a famine-stricken land, and he's so messed up that he's sitting with the pigs and he's envying the pig food. Now, he's a Jewish boy. Pigs were unclean. And he's sitting over there in the pig's die. But folks, something happens in this story. Something beautiful happens. The Bible says when he came to his senses... He came to himself. That's the quickening of the Holy Spirit. He came to himself. All of a sudden, he's sitting there. 
And he came to his senses and maybe that's what God is doing in your heart this morning. You're finally coming to your senses of saying, all I've had all along was this affiliation. All I've had all along was this chasing after possession like the prodigal son. He had no affection for the father. He just had an affiliation. All he wanted was possession. He didn't care about having a relationship. He had the service like the older brother, but no surrender. But then he came to his senses. And then he says, the Bible says, he remembered that in his father's house, even the servants have abundance. There's abundance in your father's house. And so he plans his repentance speech. He says, I will get up, I will go to my father, and I will say, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. I'm not worthy to be called your son, but I'll be your servant. Please take me in. And so he gets up and he begins to go. Isn't it interesting that in his repentance speech, he says, I will go to my father. You might have gone a long ways away from God, but he's still your father. Listen to me, you might have walked away from God for 38 years of your life, but he's still your father. And it's not over till Jesus says it's over. You don't have to be like Judas. It's not too late. You don't have to go kill yourself. It's time for you to come home. It's time for you to come back home. The father's waiting for you. And what happens is beautiful because typically, the Bible says in the Old Testament, a boy like this should be stoned to death. Next time your kids give you a hard time that you give them time out to take away the Xbox, yeah, tell them to read through the book of Leviticus, okay? <laughs> I mean, if the father didn't stone him, the elders will stone him to death. And even if they want to show him grace, they will stick him outside the city for at least a couple of weeks and let him starve to really prove his repentance. The father sees the boy. When the boy left, he had zeal. He had chutzpah. He had passion. He could not be tamed. And here he comes, walking in humble, broken. You know what the father does? He runs to him. The father does not wait for the boy to even come home. The father does not wait for the boy to come to church. The father does not wait for the boy to go have a shower. The father runs to him, meets him halfway, kisses him, hugs him, weeps over him. The boy is trying to get his speech out. Father, I've sinned against you. And he doesn't even finish his whole speech. The father cuts him off. He says, put my best robe on him. Put my best robe on him. You see, robe represented identity. You remember Joseph? He was a boy with a colorful robe. His father loved him, gave him a robe of many colors that his brothers recognized him from afar and said, that's Joseph. I recognize his robe. Jacob recognized the robe of Joseph when it was dipped in blood that his brothers bought. Robe represented identity. Do you remember that King Herod wore his kingly robes, it says. Robes represented identity. Jesus, when they crucified him, they divided his robes among themselves. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, they took off their robes and laid it down with palm branches and worshipped him because robes represented identity. And the father says, give my best robe to the boy. So that when the servants see him, what they see is the father. The boy was not looking for possession. The boy was looking to be reconciled in relationship. He was looking not just for an affiliation. He was wanting to come back to the affection of the father. And the father says, come, I will give you the possession that you need. I will restore to you your dignity. And then not just the robes, man, but the ring. That's authority. Took his ring, put it on the boy's hand. Authority. Put shoes on his feet. Identity. No longer a servant. Servants walk around barefoot. You're my son now. I'm going to raise you to sonship. You be my son. And then, not just kill any calf, kill the fattened calf that was saved for a special occasion. And this was a special occasion because the son that was dead was now alive. The son that was lost is now found. And my prayer this morning is that you would not be in a sovereign crisis, but you would come under the sovereignty of Jesus. And those who was once lost will be found. Those who was once dead will now be alive in Jesus Christ. And all of heaven rejoices when one sinner comes to repentance, the Bible says. Judas had to go kill himself. Peter, he had to deal with this crazy weight of denying Jesus. But he, like the prodigal son, Man, he knew that he had a relationship. He, had, he came to his senses almost immediately, but he had to wait a couple of days. It says in the book of John, chapter 21, Jesus meets them on the shore. The disciples are fishing, and Jesus meets them, and they're having breakfast with Jesus, man. It's going to be crazy when we get to that passage in John, chapter 21. They're having breakfast with Jesus over hot coals, roasted fish, and bread. And Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your possession? Peter says, yes, I do. 
Peter, second time Jesus says, do you love me? He says, yes. Third time, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes. And Jesus says, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. You see, Judas did not have the surrender. He did not have this relationship. All he cared about was what he could get. Jesus was not his prized possession. This whole thing was just a waste of time for him. And he started living his life like as if he was a sovereign ruler, authority over his own life. And he began to dictate his own plans. And one day, your plans will catch you. And there will come a time when you cannot run away from the consequences of your choices. And it's going to catch up to you. What are you going to do then? And I want to tell you that when you have a relationship with Jesus, you will still make stupid choices, but there's always a way back home. And if you're here today, tossing and turning around in the frustration of your life because you're living in the chaos that you've created, you don't have to worry about the crisis of God's sovereignty. Come and submit under it. Surrender under it. If the Holy Spirit's bringing you back to your senses, come home. You don't need to sit in your pigsty. And the Father will embrace you. Make him your prized possession. And he will take care of the rest. Will you please stand? We'll pray and we'll close. So I want to give you an opportunity this morning, if you're a believer, to surrender the areas that you've been trying to hold in your own hand and trying to dictate your own life as if you are the sovereign ruler of your own life, as if you are the master of your fate. You see, Judas did not like the way Jesus was doing things. And there are times when we don't like the direction that God wants to take us. Jonah did not like the direction that God wanted to take him. Moses did not like the direction that God wanted to take him. But God is sovereign. We have to come under his rule and under his reign. And oftentimes, I've said this before, it might not look right, but it's real. It's real. As you surrender to him, my prayer for you is that God will immediately restore all the peace that you've been losing. Because you know that when you try to be the sovereign ruler of your life, dear God, that's a horrible place to be. It's a terrible place to be. So my prayer for you this morning, right now, is that as you surrender those areas where you have been holding on and holding off, and you're trying to manipulate Jesus into doing your dirty work, that you will have peace right away. You'll have forgiveness. You'll have restoration. Everything that the enemy has stolen that God will not only give back to you, but multiply it to you. I also want you to know that the minute you repent, man, there's blessings, there's blessings, because in his presence, there's so many blessings that God wants to give us. But when we're living in unrepentance, we forfeit all those blessings. So empty out your pockets before him. Empty it out and say, Lord, enough, Lord, enough. Enough of me hoarding my pride. Enough of me hoarding my self-righteousness, my own wisdom. I just want all of you, God, you have your way. And for those of you that don't have a relationship with Jesus or you're doubtful about it, man, let's put an end to that today. You need to know without a shadow of a doubt that when you breathe your last, you will see his face bright, shining as a sun, and that he's ready to welcome you in. You don't need to live in doubt anymore, no matter how far you've gone, no matter how long you've gone, no matter how much you've squandered your life. I praise God that God's given you life and he's given you a chance and an opportunity now. Just like what he was doing, washing the disciples' feet, and Judas got to hear the conversation that he was having with Peter. So don't stick around with just an affiliation. Ask God to give you a deep affection towards him, man, and come to him now. Have a genuine relationship so that when those dark nights come and the enemy comes against you, you know that you have a solid relationship with Jesus. Not because you're perfect, but because he is perfect. And he died for those that are not perfect. So don't try to clean yourself up before you get right with him. Get right with him now. And that will begin the process of you being able to get cleaned. 
Let him clean you. Let him wash you. Say, Father, I'm, I'm, you are sovereign God. I'm surrendering my life to you. I'm giving myself completely to you. Not just today, but every day I'm going to do this, God. Every day I'm going to surrender my life to you. I want to grow in a deeper, stronger relationship with you. And maybe you were a believer many, many, many years ago, but you've just grown cold. Ask God to rekindle the fire. Ask God to revive you. If once you were alive, but now you feel dead, ask God to give you life again. God, breathe your life in me, God. Maybe you're burnt out because you were looking for position. You're looking for position. You're burnt out. You're angry at church. You're angry at Christians. You're angry at Christian leaders. You're angry at, at everything Christian. And this morning, God says, dude, it's not about position, man. It's about having a deep-rooted affection with me. Repent of that this morning and come to Jesus. Bypass all that nonsense and come to Jesus. Because we do not know. We do not know if God will give you this opportunity once again to respond. The Bible says if you hear his voice today, repent. Do not harden your hearts like they did in the wilderness and they all died. So repent today. Come to him. Judas could not because he had a sovereignty crisis. He saw himself as being smarter than God. He saw himself as being the author of his own fate. I pray that there'd be no one at the sound of my voice that would walk out this room, including me, still feeling like I can do this on my own. So Father, I surrender all, all to you, my precious Savior. I surrender all. And every time, my King, my love for you begins to dwindle. Every time we begin to take back what we've already surrendered, would you please, gentle shepherd, correct us, discipline us, bring us back to where we need to be. We thank you, God. We thank you for this example that you've set before us in your word. We know we ought to be more like you but it's so great to watch these disciples as they struggled in their own walk. Thank you, God, that you chose normal people, ordinary people to come and walk with you. Thank you for calling us, O oh Lord, to be your friends, to be your disciples, to be your sons and your daughters. We thank you. We love you so much. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit rest and abide on each and every one of you, oh, making you a new creation as you walk through the ups and downs of this life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys.